everybody. Welcome back to the We The Patriots podcast. For all of you revisiting viewers and for all of you new people out there, I just want to say thank you for picking this episode to start watching. This is a pretty special episode to me and to a lot of people. Um, I just want to start out by saying every single year I head out to, we call it upstate New York. It's this place up by Lake Placid where they once held this uh, Olympic Games that we had here. And we go up here, we call it the fishing trip. And this fishing trip is much more than that. But we go, we stay on a lake, we fish as a family, we end up going to all these excursions outside of fishing, go into the town, go into the city, climb mountains. Um, It's one of my favorite times of year, every single year. And to think about all of the different ways that fishing impacts us as Americans and in our lives, it's tough. And when you start thinking about it as a business, especially, it, it really starts to compare to a lot like farming has over the past couple of decades in that it's been tough to turn a profit and it's been tough to run these businesses. And the guest that we're going to have on today goes by the name of Jerry Lehman. And Jerry is one of the founders of the New England Fishermen's um, Stewardship. And the New England Fishermen's Stewardship is this organization that is starting to make the public more aware of what the, the battles that our fishermen are fighting and just how dire the situation is getting out on our shores and how much we are really being attacked as a nation, as a people. So I wanna introduce Jerry. I want to let him blow our minds with some of these statistics and kind of Uh, start to energize this debate I think that we should be having about prioritizing this clean energy or are we going to prioritize feeding our mouths with food that we know is safe and good for our generations to come. Um, I think it is as simple as that debate has nothing to do with right or left as Jerry will say at some point in the show. So let's take a pretty deep dive into this topic as it has Uh, a lot of nuance and it's definitely one of the broader topics that we've covered and we will be focusing on this definitely more than once so here we go and let's get into it i'm sure we will hit a lot of those topics and more and you're probably about to blow my mind so without any further ado Everybody, welcome back to the We the Patriots podcast. I'm your host, Sal Asante, and with me today, I have Jerry Lehman. I am very excited to have now, today we have a fisherman, everybody, and a real fisherman. This is someone who's got a lot of information that could potentially sway your thinking or bring you into a new frame of mind. Jerry, introduce yourself and a little bit about the movement and especially the shirt you got on Fight Salty. (laughs) Fight Salty is the mantra we use. Well, first, uh, I'm Jerry Lehman. Um, I'm the founder and the CEO of the New England Fisherman Stewardship Association. Uh, we're an alliance of wild harvesters of our waters off the New England, dedicated to educating the public about how best to manage our seafood resources through sound science, best practices, and conservation used by fishermen with a view towards economic well-being, ecosystem sustainability, and U.S. food securities. And what I do is is educating the public and trying to show legislators and just the broad masses of what it is that the commercial fisheries brings to the dinner table to every U.S. citizen. And um, and now we have real implications of losing our natural resources, which are U.S. food securities. And this is for the sake of development for offshore wind. And then we have collective amounts of bad data uh, coming from government agencies, which are regulating the management of our fisheries, which are having direct effects at your grocery stores. And the fact that you're getting wild, wild, heart healthy product to your dinner table is going to be a thing of the past if we keep going down this forecasted route. So, Jerry, how long have you been fishing? How long have you been around this? Is this something that your your family's been doing? Ah, yeah. Uh, Multi-generations. Everybody in my family is a fisherman. I grew up on uh, Bailey Island, which is in Harpswell, Maine. Uh, Father was a commercial fisherman, uncles, cousins. Uh, The women usually worked around the fishing industry. Uh, Wow. uh, Restaurants and everything else. Um, Urchining, uh, scalloping, shrimping, back when we had it here in the state. Ground fishing, multi-species, tuna fishing, long lining, seining. Uh, sea mossing, periwinkling. We've even gone diving for urchins. We've done it all. So 
one of the aspects of the documentary that I do want to allude to, and I'll definitely link in the description, but one of the aspects that pointed out, at least in what I was viewing, was that there is a lot of uh, forced consolidation, it seemed, on fishermen. Um, was it always that you had to be fishing for all these different types of fish in order to fill quota? Or was that something that kind of happens accidentally and you try to capitalize on as a fisherman? In order to know where we are, you got to know where we came from. I mean, back in the 1900s, I mean, we knew that the Gulf mean was rich in abundance. Problem was, we didn't have any science to wrap around it. And what we did is we forecasted money to, to give to foreign nations access into our waters. Okay. And back then, you know, it was probably like 8,500 fishing vessels out in the Gulf of Maine. I mean, day and night. These are foreign nation entities like Spain, United Kingdom, Russia. They were all right here. They were pillaging the hell out of our waters. Uh, and back in 75, we enacted the EEZ, which is the where, where the Magnuson-Stevens Act came in. And um, NOAA took over the resources or okay. National Marine Fishery Service. And then we started wrapping science and management. We booted out the foreign nation fleet. And then we cut back our own fleet because we did deplete the stocks at one time. And you fast forward now, I mean, there's less fishermen now than in colonial days. We're seeing more fish than we've ever seen. We spend more time running away from fish than actually catching fish. And then we got to compete against foreign fish, which has already been subsidized through foreign nations. And then we're doing this right. for the sake of going green. It's like, well, you know, a boat in New England burns just as much fuel as a boat out of Norway, except my fish didn't have to fly a quarter way around the world to get to your dinner table, not to mention chemically treated and processed prior for shipping. Right, especially to last that long. Yeah, well, I mean, some nations will catch fish in one nation, ship it to another nation to be processed, and then ship to the U.S. It's like yeah. you shipped product from one part of the world to a whole other part of the world and shipped it back across. It's like... Now you add up all the carbon emissions. It's like, now how green is that? Right. And then on top of that, we're going to go stick things in our ocean. So I, I want to, there's so many different avenues that we can attack this from, but I want to get your actual, your view on what is the problem with the wind in particular, the offshore wind? And what have you seen with your own eyes? Well, what I've seen with my own eyes is the ocean has a way of eating everything, you know? I've been out in massive storms here in New England. I've spent, well, my entire adult life, most of it was spent at sea. I would say three quarters of my life since 20 has been on the water, day and night. I'm 41 years old now. I have spent majority of my life at sea. Uh, that's not even counting the inshore times as a child, lobstering and everything else, a local on the island. I go, I don't even count those days. And what I've seen is the ocean is a very powerful place. So there is a lot of wind. And the thing is, there's actually more excess wind than these things are capable of handling. And these are variable components for wind energy. So they need something like between 10 and 25 knots to work. Well, last year alone, while I was fishing, I noticed it was blowing a gale. Well, a gale is when the wind increases above 35 knots. Well, these things are meant to shut down around 25 knots. Well, okay. during shutdown mode, these things are, are going to require power. Even in the shutdown mode, they don't just shut down on their own because they're not making, they're not generating power. Right. So what happens, and like I told everybody, so what happens if you have a nor'easter for four days and it's blowing 50? Then you tap on the freezing spray, the, the flaps fall off, the, I go, the blades go in the water, who's retrieving them? I go, once these structures go into the ocean floor, it's it, there's no more trawling in these areas anymore. They're right. just off the table for who knows how long. If we don't get it all, it could be for generations. You know, in the meantime, those are your natural resources. And that's what I try to tell the public. Everybody's like, I always tell everybody, go on anyfisherman.org, join as a member. We kept it $10. I can't compete against multi-billion dollar corporations, but we, the people, if we join together, can push. Okay. These are your resources. Absolutely. These favorite ones, just as much to you as they do to me. It's every American citizen's resource. Like I told everybody, what if I came up with technology tomorrow that was going to be fascinating, but I was going to kill 85% of all the ducks? Do you think people will get mad? Right. It's like, well, fish are out of sight, out of sound. So, well, what I'm telling you is, is what we're putting in here, there's potential there to wipe out a natural resource that's 
multi-generational feeding, multi-generational heritage. I go, that could feed your children's children to come and it strengthens the nation. And now we're going to give foreign owned entities access into our area, which are going to destruct our natural resources, displace commercial fisheries, which displace the coastal communities. I go, and then the network communities around these things. I mean, it, it's, it's maddening. Yeah. Now, is there any, is there any local push for all, all of this offshore wind or is it mostly uh, above your guy's head where you're, I know you're very tight knit as a local group of fishermen, but it, are they trying to basically go around you guys to to get what they need to get done? It seems like they're going around everything. Uh, the uh, people just don't know. I mean, the fact is, even NOAA and National Marine Fishery Service has even wrote a paper to OEM stating that there's a lot of data gaps. Hmm. I mean, I even just went as far as talking to the DMR and the State of Maine Department of Marine Resources. And I asked them, I go, well, there are any case studies of power cords around the shellfish industry? I go, around these power sources, there's got to be some kind of science around it. The answer was no. Well, I was down in Rhode Island over at uh, the labs down there yesterday, and I asked, I asked those guys down there, well, there must be case studies in Europe, and there's very little data, hmm. very little data. And, and then we look at the research that we've dug up, it's like, well, if haddock spawn get around these or juvenile haddock get around these cables the emf coming off the cables will slow the haddock down by 60 percent well what happens when you slow fish down well there's a reason why fish multiply in masses is because of population because right. everything under the ocean is a pre it, it, it's either eat or be eaten correct so well what happens when you take 60 percent of a stock and now it's on the dinner menu because biologically we've changed the the environment for them and we create predation zones. I go, these floating turbines put out noises at a hundred Hertz. It yeah. calls in juvenile codfish. Correct. I go, it like, calls it in. I That's go, amazing. so why would spiny dogfish, which is a, a juvenile shark that swims in major packs. I go that that's pretty much what they like to eat. I go, why would they ever leave? I go, what are the direct effects against our natural resources? I go, that feed you and me in this country, wild heart, healthy product. So once we wipe that out, well, what's the point of having a U.S. fisheries? You won't have one. Right. And do you think uh, one of the big problems is the giant decrease in fishermen, especially by way of introducing all this new law over the past few decades? And we got this mantra in, in in the nation's mind saying that there was overfishing and overfishing and overfishing. It's like, yes, it did take place at one time. Yes, it was about 50 years ago. Hmm. I go, if you look at 2000 to now, there used to be like 200 times more fishermen just 20 years ago. Do you recall whales washing up when there was like four times the effort 20 years ago? No, but when offshore winds started doing survey work in 2016, we saw a drastic increase in beachings. Amazing. Huh. Mm. Less fishermen, less traffic, increased surveys, increased whale deaths. It's like, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I go, but I can correlate one plus one. Yeah, definitely. And over the past 20 years, has it become less and less profitable to fish? Hmm. Well, expenses have gone up. You know, and now we've got, we changed the system. Now we're on a quota based system. So that means. Can you boat, explain that? Yeah. So a boat is only allocated so many fish to their permit and it's based on catch history. Well, now the management cut back, like right now, framework 65 just got pushed through. That's where we just reduced the haddock quota by 82% for all multi species fishermen in New England. So that means if your permit was just say, let's just say on the low end was only 10,000 to begin with. Now you only got 1800 pounds for the entire year. So if you were a boat last year, that's that caught 1 million pounds of haddock. Now you're allowed to catch what? 180,000 pounds of haddock. So right. if your business model was wrapped around targeting that species, which is predominant species that the U.S. consumer wants, and we have a severe abundance, yet NOAA says we don't, but people don't know why. I say, well, they collect all their 
data from the Bigelow vessel, which is run by NOAA. It's a research ship. Well, that research ship only towed 42 nautical miles in a 36,000 square mile area. That's a multi-million dollar vessel that came from you, the taxpayer. It's like, well, I could have towed 60 nautical miles in one day for $6,000. And I could have showed you twice the information that that thing did. And that's the fact is they pre-randomly chose these places to tow. It's like, well, that means that all species are in all areas at all given times. I'm like, no, they're not. How do you predict that. under the sea? Well, it's trial and error. And that's right. why multi-generational families that have passed this knowledge down from one to the other to the other, we've learned from the next. You know, of, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. You just so, don't magically learn this stuff. So have you started to establish your own research to try to combat this? I've put some stuff together using the details that I've kept. I mean, I've kept all my tracks for 20 years. I've kept my log books. I mean, if you look at the catch landings from the early 2000s, let's just say Wilkerson's, it's a piece of bottom here in the western mm -hmm. part of the Gulf of Maine. You would have seen that an average tow would have been around 1,500 pounds per vessel. So you fast forward to 2020, and now that's 3,000. So does that sound just less fish or more fish? It's... The nets are what the nets are. So, I mean, you see the catch increase in the values. That means there's more fish in the ocean. More guys are spending more time now running away from fish. Like since we did these drastic cuts of 82% reduction on the haddock, the entire fleet is now working down towards Georgia's Banks region because they have no quota and they don't want to burn it up. Because once you burn up your quota, your boat is shut down if you don't have that species. So they're putting everybody in a pinch. Now, what is – well, actually, I have a different question. When did this quota system actually start? Oh, uh, was this 2012 time? Around the 2012 region, when Jane Lepchenko was in office at NOAA, they pushed for this catch share program. Okay. And with that, has it been steady reduction in limits every year? You were watching larger corporations got their hands in it and bought up 25% of all of our natural resources. Like Blue Harvest was a foreign nation-owned hedge fund corporation from a Netherlands family. And just as of today, they have locked their doors shut. They called in their boats. So now those boats and those employees are all unemployed. In the meantime, the boats that were bringing wild, heart-healthy product to the U.S. people and the U.S. consumer are not coming. Wow. That's how drastic this is, just because of all well, this that this somebody on. on a foreign nation feeding us. Right. Absolutely. It has to. There's no other solution. Which increases carbon emissions. Imagine that. And not to mention they're applying poison on your table and your children's dinner table. It's like people don't understand where their fish come from. There's a massive difference between a wild caught product. I go, one, you didn't have to seed it. You didn't have to plant it. You didn't have to chemically treat it. You didn't have to turn over the soil. You did nothing. You just manage, sustainably manage, like harvest it and go, and it's repeating pattern. It falls into cycles. This lasts for generations. We've been doing these things for well over 400 years here on our own coast. And the indigenous tribes did it way longer than that. Right. That, I mean, at one time, codfish was considered, was part of our monetary system in the United States. There was a reason they called it green gold. So <laughs> with all of this stuff coming down on you guys. What is this organization that that you have? Would you be able to explain a little bit about the New England Fisherman Stewardship? Yeah, the New England Fisherman Stewardship Association is, well, it's like the Ground Fish Committee Councils right now for the Fishing Council. It's a council of members. There's not a fisherman on the council. So I call it a fisheries council. So what I've done is I've taken educated on the job, blue collar, working men and women who actually know the business in and out and their family ties. I go, and I know how these develop through the communities and the economics surrounding their communities. You know, the real knowledge, not some Ivy League student that came in fresh off the fresh off the platform. I go, I planted, you know, these are the individuals that have been here, grassroots, you know, these are the men and women who feed our country, wild, heart healthy, sustainable product. And, you know, we were, this was stuff that was given to us that was meant for us to pass to the next generation. And due to policy and regulations, we can't even keep ourselves alive. And so what does that do to the infrastructure? Well, we're, the infrastructure is collapsing. 
once it's collapsed, you don't get it back. And now you've made foreign dependency. So now our U.S. food resources are going to be dependent upon another nation who are not as restringent and not as policied and not as regulated as the U.S. fisheries. We're the most regulated fishermen in the world, hands down. So we're environmentally friendly. We have little to no impact on these things. I mean, mm -hmm. people like to say it's commercial vessels killing the whales. It's like, no. I've been out at sea for 20 years, better part of 20 years. I can tell you right now, I've seen plenty of families and whales. Don't ever recall killing one. Right. You know, Especially not accidentally. No. I mean, we fish around these things all of our lives. You know, as far right. as I'm concerned, they're like friends. It's somebody to, you know, I'm at sea for 10 days at a time. It's like. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? So, saw you last week. See you again. See you next time. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's just craziness. And then everybody wonders why. And I go, well. Some of these surveys were seismic blast tested with nitrogen blasts. It's like, well, a jet engine at 20 yards puts out, what, 125 decibels? Well, seismic nitrogen gun and oxygen gun blasts coming from these vessels every 15 seconds put out noises around 265 decibels. So you can imagine a jet engine at 20 yards. Now crank that up times two plus 50. Yeah, might deafen you just a wee bit. Huh. Which, what happens when whales get spooked you know right. they won't breed they don't migrate properly they they get scared they burn up energy they're big creatures they burn right. energy well eventually they're going to get tired some of them beach you know some of them get disorientated the calves and the and the females get separated i go they can't hear each other and noise is everything to them right that's how they communicate everything well, they're mammals. Of course they're going to come to the surface i don't see headlights on whales meanwhile survey boats that that numb them, turn around and hit them in the night. It's like, well, you don't know. There's not a headlight on a whale. You notice? It's common sense stuff. Oh, it's not applied. It's like, well, like I said, I go, if you look at early 2000s, there was four times as much commercial fishing activity. Four times than what we have existing now. I go, right. there was no uptick in whale deaths then. Odd. But magically, when the surveys start, huh, wonder what the variable is. So what are you guys doing as an organization to try to combat this? Because I can only imagine it's just like you're fighting an unknown unknown opponent at this point. Well, I mean, I could try telling everybody, I don't want to make this a political issue. I go, this is merely a right and wrong. This is a good versus evil for, for the most part. But like what? I go, well, you're offering to take crippling a nation. That's what's going to happen. We're going to cripple the nation. I go, just look at the state of Maine alone. I go. One billion dollar industry alone in the in the lobstering. So mm. the synthesis of science that came out from NOAA and Rhoda as of March of 23 states that 68% commercial fisheries displacement. So what's 68% of a billion dollars? That's 680 million dollars. That right. you disrupt that in local communities and economies. You think that might have a slight effect? Right. Might, maybe just a little bit. Right. And then you're going to take into effect that 40% of the island and the coastal communities in the state of Maine are fixed income. And then I think CBS just put out that 60% of America is living paycheck to paycheck. So you shut off that kind of money. What does that do to the infrastructure, the communities, and the economy in your local areas along the seaboard? Correct. It's like, wake up. I go, that's not just the fishermen. I go, yeah, the fishermen produce a product, which go to you, the consumer. But in order for us fishermen to do our jobs, we need the guys at the shipyard. We need the guys at the fuel docks, the mm -hmm. ice plants, the packers, the boxers, the truckers, the fork truck drivers, the fork truck builders, you know, the guys that make the cardboard boxes, the guys that make the wrappings for them, the guys that make the stamps. All those people are going to the unemployment line. Where do we where do we go? Right. It's, I got your person backing up. If you're on the coastal community, why don't you walk down, especially in the state of Maine, walk outside, look to the left and look to the right, because either both of your neighbors or at least one of your neighbors has got to go if this goes through. That, I mean, that's uh, sick. It's sick. It's very sick. I mean, look at the state of Maine. I think the combined cycle power plants in the state of Maine are like $1 million a megawatt. If you use vineyard and block island wind, that makes it like $5 million a megawatt. And oh. floating, that's fixed offshore wind, and floating's double. Oh, my God. 
So if you're on a fixed income, like 60% of the nation now living paycheck to paycheck, well, if I took your $200 light bill and I made it a $2,000 light bill, do you think you're going to, what are you going to lose in order to turn the lights on? Your car payment, your cell phone, stop feeding Correct. yourselves. Correct. Something's got to go. And then yep. energy is going to, is going to drive inflation through the roof. I mean, Absolutely. hell, it costs energy to create an apple. Yeah. You still got to get out there and pick it. Absolutely. I mean, so this is where I want to, I want to bring back a little bit to where I'm coming from personally, because it's really affected me. And I kind of got to talking about it with my co-host a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and excuse my, my garage going off right there if you hear it. Um, so we work, my family works in, a, in the land landscaping industry. And we've been in this industry for three generations now. I'd be the third with my brother and some of my cousins. And what we do is almost full service landscaping that you could think of in New Jersey of, of all places. I'm sure you'd expect it there. And so we're a bunch of Italians and we all go do our landscaping. It's the most stereotypical New Jersey thing you could think. And but the problem that we're seeing with us is overregulation in a very similar way, but forced use of electric equipment. So getting rid of our gas engines, starting to use instead of two stroke, all this battery powered equipment like lawn mowers and trimmers and all this type of stuff. Are you seeing similar sorts of attacks on your equipment, like your vessels? Are they trying to push for uh, net zero vessels in some way? They're asking about putting EV inside of a boat. And like I told them, I go, well, I've been on a steel dragger for 23 years. Well, I can tell you right now that all that the ocean at over course of time eats everything. You already said it. It's this show. Yeah. I go, electrolysis is a real thing. I go, it eats steel. So even the piping on the vessel has to be changed out throughout its life because right. eventually it wears and then it'll blow. And then when it blows, you're in a steel can floating with buoyancy. So now if I put an EV in there, or I mean, if a pipe bursts down in your engine room and everything's electrical, are you going to go down there and electrocute yourself before you drown yourself? That sounds like a wonderful idea, Jerry. Oh, sounds awesome. Sign me up. Be 150 miles offshore, getting myself electrocuted, and then I get to drown if that doesn't finish me off. That's. I'm glad that you're able to give a little pushback. Has there has there been any uh, any sense that they're going to cram it down anyway? They're trying to cram it down now as we speak, and that's what I've been trying to wake. We up. have it here. 2025 or 2024, I believe, is the institution of our ban on on gas powered engines for. Um, handheld equipment well oh, it's, I've, I've been trying to tell i'm trying to wake people up to this as fast as possible but it's such a broad spectrum of thought that you know you lose people a lot of the times so what i try to do is i just have a conversation with them it's like look right. nothing coming out of my mouth everything coming out of my mouth is fact i've researched i've read the synthesis of science i go i've spent Science is dictated as the natural observation of the natural world. I've spent 17 years in the last 23 at sea, day and night, observing these things. And meanwhile, we're being dictated by somebody who sits behind a desk. Huh. So how much science is that called when you're sitting behind a desk? How much of that natural observation of the natural world are you really witnessing based on 42 nautical miles out of a 36,000 square mile area? That's like an epiphany of one twelfth of one percent. That's good. It's one fourth of one percent. So how do you have any logical thinking or think that you can make a management decision that disrupts the economy and the communities for which you're managing based on one twelfth of one percent? No, it's insane. And so it, when I was watching in your documentary, it shows that you guys really put some effort into trying to put forward a very well a very well thought out and very well researched uh, band of statistics to try to go against Noah. Noah's absolutely certified and unchanging, right? Well, and Noah has issues of its own, but offshore wind development is being pushed more from BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy. Uh, okay. okay. So Noah and the National Marine Fisheries is supposed to be a guiding to the Magnuson Stevens Act, which it takes into effect local economy related around the fisheries. BOEM doesn't have to. So even though if BOEM takes over a swath and destroys the natural resources, which kills the industry and damns the impact of the economy and the communities along this network with, 
And that's not applied to their their mandate. And Noah doesn't do anything to try to step in and stop them? Noah has already written reports and during certain task force readings um, like this, the effort of OEM and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science to develop regional spatial suitability model is a good first step towards in identifying potential areas for future leasing, but additional information should also be considered prior to designating wind energy areas, especially in the Gulf of Maine. They've even written reports stating that we highlighted the unique nature of the Gulf of Maine ecosystem and the presence of vulnerable complex habitats, such as deep sea corals, protected species, and designated critical habitat for endangered North Atlantic right whales. Also noted substantial data gaps, including the lack of sufficient and comprehensive mapping of benthic habitats and sea corals, sponges, and distributions of vital fisheries and lobster and unknown effects of floating with wind technology on marine sources. So what does that say? That means we don't have enough data to accumulate any kind of conclusion based on what they want to develop because we don't know what the effects are. Now, we've talked about it in the state of Maine, and they accepted an offshore wind scientific lease site. They were supposed to put 12 turbines on there, and we were supposed to see the effects in a localized environmental impact study, you know, right. actual research. That sounds like a good idea. Well, the problem is, is NOAA, National Marine Fisheries and the Science Center doesn't have a baseline for the New England region. We have with such big data gaps there from either COVID. The last complete survey we've done in New England was back in 2019. Yeah, I saw that. That was that was heavily mentioned. So 23 boys. But it seems like they keep they keep making that excuse at this point that it, it was COVID and we're and we're recovering from that. Or even I'd I'd heard snippets that they mentioned they did recover and they've already caught up with their their data. But there's huge gaps at this point. That's a lie. That's a lie. How could you go back and collect data from a year that's passed? Because they're using prehistory from 20 years ago and filling they in data no idea. gaps. It's like you can't use the past to fill in the data gaps from the future because the presence, we already know what runs in a cycle. I go, look at, look at the landing reports in the western part of Gulf of Maine in the early 2000s. The predominant species landed was Pollock. If you fast forward to 2020, the predominant species is now Haddock. But you're telling me there's no Haddock and you had to reduce the management by 82%, which kicked us all out of the Gulf of Maine into Georgia's banks. But in the meantime, the guys that do go into the Gulf of Maine have to run away from Haddock, you know, the same place where they weren't supposed to be. Something is saying, yeah, they're saying a guy that made one twelfth of one percent and a guy that spends 240 days a year at sea are seeing two ends of the rainbow here, and that's not the same color. Hey guys, just wanted to take one second away from the show here to let you know that we really appreciate you listening. What we would really appreciate even more would be if you could share this, go favorite it, go like it on your podcast app, and just let anybody know that you think might engage with this, even if they really hate us. Go send it to them. Get them to see if they'll watch it, see if they'll engage, see if they will start to spark up that conversation. Let's get this popping over here. Let's get these numbers up and let's start to get these views and these followers up there. Let's start monetizing this and let's start getting to a point where we can start reaching out to some bigger platform. Let's get back to the show. Jerry, you are awesome, man. <laughs> I love the way that you are putting this. I mean, to you, at least you make it entertaining because I feel like you can get lost in the weeds here pretty bad. Well, the fact is, is it's it's how do we collect data? Okay, let's talk about this. We'll do a basic so I can get you caught up on how NOAA collects data. So the Bigelow vessel gets a piece of paper that has predetermined toes on it. They have protocols that say they have to tow at three knots, so they can't tow any faster than three knots. They have a protocol that says it has to be one depth. They have a protocol that says it's three to one wire. So that means if they're in, let's just say if you're in 100 feet, you have to set 300 feet of wire. That's mm -hmm. what a three to one, seven to one scope. So if you're in 100 and it's seven to one scope, it's 700 feet. Sure. Well, they're using a frame that we would use to jump over mountains with. And they're telling us we're doing accurate flounder surveys. It's like, well, that's funny because an average dragger uses a three inch to an eight inch cookie and tows at 2.3 and your protocol's at three knots. So you're towing 0.7 faster and you're using three times the frame. You're not actually sampling, you're jumping over the fish. 
Got and then it. you're going to use that crappy data to come up and tell me, based on very little toes, how much fish is in this broad area. Meanwhile, you've only checked my pinky nail, but by checking my pinky nail, you're going to tell me what all of this behind me is. It's like, no, no. And how are how are you um, able to get access? Do they have to publish how how they do their their data collection? Yes, uh, it's part of the NTAC committee. Uh, they, they, I was just down there uh, last month uh, in Maryland, Baltimore, at the uh, Maritime Conference Center. Um, the Science Center even came in during the committee meeting and even said, we have no baseline case study in the Northeast New England region. Well, okay, I'm not the PhD of the bunch, so I'll keep my question simple like a fisherman should, I guess, and say this. Whether it's in life or in business, if you don't know where you are, how the hell do you know where you're going? Correct. Couldn't agree more. And now they're saying we can't even use the trawl surveys that we use for the Science Center inside of the array areas. So now they're looking at long lines. That's like, well, long lines are not the same catch rate as that of a trawler. I go, so there's no baseline on that. So again, with no baseline, how do you test your hypothesis? Now, tell me if I'm being a little bit too more too logical here, but wouldn't the logical question be how could you be setting any sort of limit on what I'm catching if our data is so contradictory? That's exactly what we're saying. And like we said, oh, why don't there's a thousand NOAA agents here in New England? There's like 40 trawlermen left that can tow from Gulf of Maine to Georgia's banks. You're telling me we couldn't find one employee to talk to 40 people or hell, maybe 10 employees to talk to four individuals, or maybe just pick one NOAA agent to every one fisherman and have them talk about what they see and saw. Right. Last fall, 15 of us dragon captains were down in Gloucester at the Sector building. There was 355 years of experience in that room. Not one person in there has ever talked to NOAA about the biomass of our species, of our natural resources in our world. Not one. Wow. Now, That's these are the a... same people that sleep out there day and night, working around the clock for years. You know, of what is science? What's the definition of science? The definition of science states the natural observation of the natural world. Huh. So, what does NOAA have? One twelfth of 1%. After five years, they've got one fulfilled survey in five years. Meanwhile, you've got 40 guys who have spent 240 days a year at sea running away from fish that you say doesn't exist. So call me crazy, but I'm going to go with the guy that spends his life out there. I think Why I am too. Fisherman wipe out a fish. What would he do tomorrow? Exactly. Yeah. And one, one thing I did want to call back way back to was I'm sure that your parents and or grandparents were fishing as well. Did they ever remark on the fact that there was that actual time when fish seemed down where the catch was tough to get? And that was the problem, not the overregulation, but the fact that catching fish was actually an issue. Well, if you talk to fishermen, especially like in the 70s and stuff, I mean, it was a whole different ballgame back then. You know, the stocks were weren't right. We, we, we caught too many fish. You know, we take out too much, they don't reproduce, and then the, the stock numbers go down. Well, fast forward, we have less fishermen than we've ever had. We've seen an uptick in catch ratios. But the fact of the matter is we're basing our our assumptions on assumptions. Why don't you We're running with worst case scenarios? Yeah. Well, what if you don't well, they're the only one, the one that the one that can shove their stuff through without any sort of question, it seems. Well, OEM likes to tell everybody in the public hearings that them and Noah are like this. But then you go over to Noah and they're like, well, no, we've told them they need to do this, this and this. But they don't have to because they don't have to listen to us because they take the lead. So are they really sisters? Right. And the fact that well, who's asking to develop these things. These are foreign nation owned corporations. 
And, you know, everybody's like, oh, we're going to create 50,000 renewable jobs. I go, yeah, but you got a damn 200,000 to get there. You know, the same ones that have been here for 400 years, you know, people come to the New England to eat their haddock, to eat their lobster. I go, but now we've killed the fishery, we shut it off, and now we're importing it for the sake of going green, which is increasing carbon emissions. I go, you have got to be kidding me. It's so backwards. So- do you foresee any sort of resolution to this that's positive? Because it seems that we need to get jobs back in this area or else we're in deep trouble. Well, that's just it. I mean, even Noah admits there's an aging of the fleet. And like I told people, I go, the guys that go out to sea, I go, for 10 days at a time, I go, they weren't taught this in a school. This didn't mm-hmm. come in classroom. They didn't read it in a book. They were trained by individuals who had done it with history. And time and experience this is something that has to be lived in order to be learned because the cycle shifts and the cycles change and these are the things you have to learn to to look at and the fact is is we're being managed by a system that's not even looking right i mean it's just not looking i mean really you're going to tell me 42 miles out of a 36 thousand square mile area one twelfth of one percent is considered enough data to say anything and it's not like they don't have the money. They're putting out a thousand agents, like you said. How really? could they not put together a few more boats? They, they have one only have to go to work. I don't know. They have to go to the office two days every pay period. They get paid every two weeks. Two weeks. Yes. Okay. So the fact is, I spent five years in Portland Harbor in Maine. I spent at least five or six years in Gloucester. I spent another five or six in Boston, and I've spent another four in New Bedford. I'm a pretty networked commercial fisherman. I go, do you know how many NOAA agents I've ever seen down at the wharf? Maybe three in 23 years. You know how many times I bumped into the research vessel? Maybe four times in 23 years. So if I'm not, if they're not at the office and they're, if they're not on the boat and they're not at the dock, then where are they? It you know? doesn't seem right, Jerry. It it's doesn't not seem right. right. This is not right. And the fact is we're pushing ahead because it's big money from foreign money. It's like, so now you're going to ask the American people, I go, to kill the resources for the sake of going green, which does nothing to combat and stop offshore wind development. They already said it in the Boeing papers. It says this does not stop climate change. I mean, anything, we're going to ramp it up. Unbelievable. And by not allowing the U.S. fishermen access to go fishing and bringing wild, heart healthy product to your dinner table, we are asking for nations who are not regulated and no policies like our own, who actually do pillage the shit out of their bottom, to fly it overseas, creating a higher increase in carbon emissions to feed you. And now you're under their regime to send you product, and they're going to be under contracts because right. we're going to be desperate. Right. Because we've killed our resources. We don't have anywhere else to get the food. Well, you can't just magically grow fish. You can't just tell. Well, you can't just tell fishermen to buy boats. <laughs> well, they're pushing aquaculture fin fish farms. It's like, well, that's funny because you got to give those fish tetracycline, and tetracycline is what we give patients with pneumonia. Right. It's an antibiotic. So what happens when we start treating you with a fish that's already has an antibiotic in 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 the in the meat well eventually you're going to get sick sometime well guess what you've already been adding doses of antibiotics you just didn't know it so what do we give you now when you're sick i don't have an answer for you neither do i i'm not a doctor but i'm sure it's not good no i i try to avoid them at all costs to be honest with you um well i mean even the salmon fin var- fish fish farms and these aquaculture pens, they have to feed them carotene chemical supplements to dye the meat orange so you don't get grossed out by seeing a great piece of flesh in front of you so you don't puke. Why? Because that's a natural color. Of the they create sea lice. They destroy the environment around them. I go, they crap that chemical back out of their own bodies, which then the natural habitat eats it and it poisons them. It's, it's, it creates algae blooms. It's disgusting. <laughs> I'm, I'm so disgusted we're flying fish in from china that was raised in a feces pool and if people yeah. don't know what feces is it's crap we, we they raise them in crap fillet them process them and then fly them across the pond from the pacific to our dinner table and that's what you're reading right. chinese crap. right no i mean it's it's really starting to hit home it seems like everywhere uh-huh. um 
one thing I wanted to ask that I wanted to confirm that I heard was that there is more than likely conservation is buying out tags for fish and just using it to either hold it over your head or just not use it for the sake of saving the fish, quote unquote. Well, it's like this. Back in the 90s, we had a buyback program. They didn't buy back the boats. They bought the permits. And they put the permits on a shelf, or were right. supposed to be pushed down, you know, to, to future fishermen in the future. So that way we can keep a steady natural resource of wild, hard, healthy product to you, the U.S. consumer. But instead, because we're fishermen and we don't know what we're doing because we can't be trusted, large conservation groups and NGOs decided to create permit banks. And now you have to buy a fish in order to go catch a fish in hopes that the market is better than that, which you've already prepaid, so you can make a profit, which makes your business viable. What is buy a fish, catch a fish? Well, let's go some sector programs, because if I need, I can't leave the dock unless I have enough quota in each species. So if I don't have any haddock quota, I have to buy some. Well, as the year works on, well, the price of quota keeps going up from these are vessels and permit holders like permit banks that aren't fishing well they're going to lease you their their quota so there's you know some journey journey. Journey on it and getting paid yeah so this framework 65 went in it started off the first day was the haddock quota was a dollar 50 haddock at the market's only a dollar 20 so if you bought a dollar 50 fish not only your time your effort your fuel and your costs uh, you have to eat but then you have to eat the dollar 20 on top of it and then you have to take 30 cents away from another product in order to start to even come up with a paycheck All right it's like really it's like what at this point why don't we just tie all the boats up that just it's sounds like you, you can't financially make the business work it's like you're telling guys that they have to go risk, guys and girls, that they have to go risk their lives to go out to sea to get the hell kicked out of them, to bring home a wild, heart healthy product. I go, for no money? Huh? They just risk their lives to bring you the best protein rich you could ever ask for. I mean, you can't, you can't chemically make this in a plant. This is wild, natural, sustainably, heart healthy, zero environmental impacts. I go, and everything. I go, it's natural. And you're going to destroy it for the sake of going green while creating problems. I go, they're asking right now to get this. This is the Gulf of Maine behind me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that green area is the 9.8 million acre roll call area that they're looking for putting development in. That's Georgia's banks and the Gulf of Maine. I mean, that's Cape Cod and that's Gloucester, Portland, Maine, and all the way to down east to Canada. So from everything from this line back to shore in green is the roll call area. They want to get this down to a 2 million acre lease hmm. for development for offshore wind. That's well, terrible. These cables emit EMF fields. Like I said, these EMF fields, we've already put out the research. You can see it on anyfisherman.org. We put out a whole thing. I go, right. I mean, we, we if you just take a little bit of applied knowledge, you know, a little forethought, it's amazing. It's amazing what you'll come up with. I mean, we're going to wipe out our natural resources. Well, absolutely. Country. Yeah, it sounds like we're going to, not just that, actually, it sounds like we're possibly radiating our food source and making it dangerous to our, our kids and our future generations as well. Yeah, not you're going to monetarily. Poison, you're poisoning America. Agreed. And you're going to make us dependent on foreign nations to feed us, and then we're going to have to get chemically lab-grown meats? It's like, are you crazy? That's going to be poisoned as well. We're just getting poisoned, it seemed like. Well, on that's just it. You can't afford to turn the power on, because I just told you 60% of people live paycheck to paycheck, and if we increase the, the rates by five times, I go, nobody's living here. So that means either you stop eating, you stop going out, which collapses the economy around us and why is this important to the fishermen well these are the people that move our product these are the people that buy our product so if there's no demand because they can't even afford to turn their lights on well, what the hell do they need to fish for i could not agree more jerry i think you got to tell me what what my not only myself but us the listeners what we can do to try to help you guys out and forwarding your your mission to try to help you guys at least get some of your way of life back well, like I told everybody, this is about uniting the, the U.S. people. 
You know, right. you don't have to be a fisherman to join a membership with NAFSA. I kept it at ten dollars to be cheap because I can't compete against billion dollar industries, but we the people could push back against our legislators to say this is not for us. We can't financially take this. I mean, it's going to collapse our heritage. It's going to collapse the whole networking system that we built New England around. And that's not even just this fishing. I mean, Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, the Pacific. 82% of our fish are coming from overseas, boys and girls. There's three oceans around our country, Pacific, Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. You're telling us 82% of our fish has to come from foreign nations. Are you out of your mind? I, I, and now you're going to develop stuff from foreign nation-owned companies. You're like, oh, it's 50,000 jobs. It's like, yeah, but 49,000 of those jobs are for foreign nations for every 1,000 American jobs. And that's only for construction. Right. You ain't going to need that many once it's deployed. Correct. So you, you just unemployed 200,000 people that created the economy along the coast. I go, and then now that infrastructure is collapsing upon itself, which collapses the shipyard, and collapses the banks, which collapses the restaurants, which collapses your homes. So when everybody's unemployed and there's no money coming in, who's feeding everybody? You can't feeding anybody anymore because we just killed the natural resources because we didn't do any case studies. And we don't know. That's what I'm saying. It's not, it's not that any fisherman is saying no to going green. It's just like what you're asking for is greater than what we can afford. Agreed. It, we don't know. That's the problem. It's like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am wrong. I go, but well, maybe we should find out first. I mean, before we start wiping out something that's been feeding this nation and the indigenous people since the beginning of time as people of civilization itself, I go, you think we might want to take a check? Just maybe, maybe even double check. I think so. I think it's well worth your while. And I, I really do implore people to go out and at least give your website a look. And it really opened my eyes to, I mean, like I said, I, I had a lot of preconceived notions because of a lot of things that I've been looking into and researching already in my whole lifetime. And you still had so much proof and so much documentation of wrongdoing and failures to report. I think that it's so egregious now and it's, it's clearly well, affecting us in our society. Noah's research vessel was caught back in trawl gate because they were towing their net like this sideways. They weren't catching anything. And they were still using the data as part of the management for telling us how much fish we were allowed to catch because they couldn't catch a fish, which depleted the fisheries. And now we've dwindled and dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And everybody's wondering why the tilapia is so cheap because China's feeding you crap. And in the meantime, the wild heart healthy product that's good for you and your family for longevity, you know, it's good for your body, which is good for the soul. Now we're feeding you poison. And now we're going to offer you these other poisonous ideas for the sake of looking green. But in the, so, the whole time, this isn't green. I go, so we're going to go green for the sake of Killing what our nation, killing our communities, killing the network families around the fishing. I go, there's not even case studies about what happens when the cables get too close to shellfish. There's, there's been no studies. There's you think one. you're going to find out before you start electrocuting the bottom with EMF fields <laughs> and heat sources? I mean, the cooling stations are going to take in 50 degree water on the ocean floor and pump out not 90 degree water. I mean, the one they got off Vineyard Wind right now, 62 turbines. That's 13 megawatts a piece the generators make on the fixed poles. They have a cooling station that takes in 7 million gallons every day of 50 degree water and pumps back out 90 degree water every day. So now let's look at what they want. I actually did the spatial planning. Imagine that based on the last vineyard wind. They're like, well, Jerry, that's fixed offshore wind. It's not floating. I go, yeah, but the power generators that sit on top of the damn post is what matters. Mm -hmm. You made state of Maine asked for three thousand. I go, Massachusetts asked for ten, but we're building twenty. Does anybody know why other than myself? They're like, what? I go, well, there's an additional seven been thrown in there, but everybody's being quiet about it. It's because there's a 45% capacity loss from the transference of power. So if you actually built 13 megawatts, which the state of Maine and Massachusetts asked for, you really only get eight megawatts of power. So they wow. have to 20 they to get to overbuild. Well, if you use that, so it's 806 megawatts for and 62 turbines. So that means it's 74 turbines for a thousand. So if the state of Maine asked for 3,000, well, simple math at this point, what's 74 times 20? You're looking at over 1,480 turbines. 
Well, they told us they need one square mile per turbine for deployment. I go, well, that's 1,480 square miles. There's 640 acres in a square mile. That's People. only a 974,200 acre lease, but you're asking for 2 million. So what are you doing with the other 1,050,000 acres? My goodness, people, we got to wake up. This yeah. is going to. So I actually did the, to scale using 10 by 10 nautical charts. So that means 100 turbines to a square. Well, what happened when we started Where do you like, fish? Yeah. Where do you fish? You just took over 20% of the bottom. And that bottom is what the migration pattern of the fish will, will be disturbed, which we live in a gyre. That's oh, why I put these blue air. We are in a counterclockwise spin. So what comes around goes around. So not only could we destroy our own natural wild resources, I go, but we could damn the future to come. In the no, meantime, we're, gonna, we're surely going to displace the communities by increasing 100%. the rates. Oh, that's it. You're, the rates are going to be huge. And I, I, all I could think about is just the decimation of wildlife. When is this supposed to be implemented? Well, that's just it. And then once this lease goes in, that means they're going to start doing survey in the Gulf of Maine. So these whales and mammals washing up on the beaches. To the it's only going to go up. Are going to be coming up here to the New England. So next time you come to Maine, New Hampshire, Cape Cod, well, you might as well make room for a whale steak because it's yeah. going to be cooking on the beach. Absolutely. And not to mention yeah. what gets killed and doesn't make the beach. Nobody talks about that right. one. Did anybody send a sub down with a camera to look around these areas to see how many cars are on the ocean floor? I can Probably. And in the meantime, your natural resources, which we use as a nation, you know, that's what strengthens a nation when you have security. Well, what's more secure than knowing you have a natural abundance of food that can feed your nation for generations? And now you're just putting it on the chopping block for a virtue signal. The test array is something that needs to be done and it needs to be done correctly and it needs to be monitored. We need to do at least three to five years study prior to development to have a baseline of what species go in that area during what times of the year. Then when you initiate the science array, you need to be able to sample it the same direction as you did during the previous five years to see what the adverse or pro effects were. And then we can have a logical conversation about the rest of it, but not until. I agree. You can't just stick these things into the water, man. No, this, is, this is absurd. In the cart in front of the horse. I agree. Severely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I hope that I hope that everybody seeing this takes takes a little bit of action. Jerry, I want you to just take a minute to send out the links and let everybody know the name of the organization and the website we should head to. Yeah, well, with the New England Fisherman Stewardship Association. You can find us at anyfisherman.org. Um, we have a Twitter account that's at Fish Stewardship. Uh, our Instagram is underscore NEFSA, N E F S A underscore. Um, we put out documentaries. Um, you can even find it on YouTube, Undersea Empire. Um, we talk about these things. Uh, my contact information is in there. I'm always willing to engage to educate people. Like I said, I mean, if science is dictated on the natural observation of the natural world, and I've spent better part of my adult life at sea watching these things day in and day out documented recorded them video logged them kept all my tracks i go and now you've got an agency that has one twelfth of one percent i go who do you want i go i have nothing to gain by this i go but uh, my my family's future has everything to lose from it i could and I so could does every other more. american citizens uh, well, this has got to stop we have got, this has got to stop. This is going too far. Now you're going to disrupt communities, economy, the commercial fishing heritage, which has kept this nation alive. I mean, there's a reason they want this. Yes. There has to be. There's always a reason. Well, always a reason. there's always a reason behind it. It's like, well, guys, I'm not trying to be the pessimist of the bunch. It's like, I'm here to educate you on what I know based on what I've seen and experienced in my life at sea. And when you apply it with the research papers, I mean, I've read hundreds of papers. I mean, I'm, I'm not just a, I mean, I've read the synthesis of science. I've read the economical impacts, even in Maine and Massachusetts. I've read the statistics. I even went as far as finding out where the minerals to create these things are coming from. I mean, the minerals alone, cobalt is a major mineral needed for batteries and generators. 100%. Well, do you know where 70% of all the cobalt in the world comes from? Well, it's not America. It's the Democratic Republic of Congo. Absolutely. 70% of the world com 
uh, comes from there. Well, guess what else? Director of Rand Corps, Brad Martin, Institute for Supply Chain Security. China has the ability to deny access to cobalt, creates a national security vulnerability, stockpiling of minerals and rights, but the U.S. hasn't. Cobalt has to increase 403%. Do you know what the Democratic Republic of Congo is also well known for? Labor. labor in the world. Yep. They and take it from people. Crazy. China. Chinese. Yep. So even though these are European foreign nations that we are developing with here, well, those minerals still have to come from somewhere. So now we're giving subsidies to a foreign nation from Europe to buy mineral rights from China. So we're just doing a transference of wealth. We're doing a transference of wealth, correct. Time That's to absolutely. wake up. Time to wake up. Everybody, this has been Jerry. I think I want to continue a little bit onto our um, not-so-public show, I think. And for everybody else, I think you should go follow Fight Salty as well on Instagram because you'll see a little bit of – is that your crew that you show sometimes or is that just yeah, video? Fight Salty is um, – uh, he does a lot of the work. I mean, we use it as a mantra to unite all fisheries. You know, this is okay. not – we've tried purchasing management teams – fresh out of college, you know, to work yep. with these work groups from the science centers, you know, figure we'd buy a few of our own yep. at working together. Well, they drink the Kool-Aid eventually. And then this, is <laughs> yep. you know, it's looking at money. They Got don't it. have money. The nation's broke. It's like, but we, the people, we, the fish, commercial fisheries provide a sustainable, wild, heart, healthy product to you, the U.S. people. You know, something yep. that, you, that you want. I mean, who has ever set, come to the New England, sat around a dinner table, pissed off eating a seafood dinner? Have you ever seen anybody? No, they're always happy. They're always smiling. Everybody's in a good mood. Why not? It's the best product. It tastes great. I go, it brings families together. I go, it unites economies. I go, there's no closer commu uh, knit communities I go, than coastal communities. That's because we're dependent upon each other. Very dependent that's on each other. It's a lovely part of Americans. it. Agreed. You know, that's the beauty of what we do. Why do you think people want to leave the city and live with us? In the meantime, boot us from our area. But the whole thing that made it great here was us. Right. Yeah, that's the difference, man. That's that's America, though. And that's that is the uh, in my in my opinion, the vision of America. And I think that's what we need to fight to achieve again. And uh, yeah, I, I just can't. In the third world if this keeps being allowed to come through. That's what it seems like. You're going to displace all the network communities along the coast, which are going to have adverse trickle effects to the economies and the local communities that network inland. This is this is like a cancer that will spread. You scared the crap out of me, Jerry. Officially, I I I think. Um, well, it's time for America to wake up. I think, we, I think we all need to wake up. And until I think we're going to have to do another show at some point. Hopefully, you can update us on some progress. Um, until then, Jerry, thank you, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Right. Very good. Be well. Damn, I wish I were to fucking stay. I want to be something, not nothing. Trapped inside my dream, and I'm running, running away from these demons. But the feeling's so good, I'm going to keep dreaming.